see that popcorn. How many of you, when you go to the Regal Theaters and they put popcorn in the bag, you tell them to butter halfway up? Anybody? Like, give me all the butter. If it drips on my jeans, I don't really care. You know, I want that butter when I'm there. So we continue in a series that we've uh, called At the Movies. And what we're doing in this series is taking some of the popular movies of this summer, uh, pulling out the theme that Hollywood uh, put there, and we're comparing it to what the Bible says. And so week one, we looked at the movie Avengers Infinity Wars, you know. And so there we made this comparison between uh, the Avengers and Thanos and David and Goliath. And David and the Avengers had to face some over, overwhelming obstacles, you know. And uh, so the, the key thought out of that message was simply this that when we go into a battle, the battle's often won before the battle's begun. In other words, where we stand with God when we go into a battle often affects the outcome of that particular battle. Week two is the movie uh, Incredibles, or I mean, sorry, what, Won't You Be My Neighbor? I mean, who doesn't love Mr. Rogers, huh? Uh, there was a guy in the Bible named Barnabas that had a lot of Mr. Rogers characteristics. Uh, he was accessible, he was consistent, he was... He was encouraging, and he would celebrate your successes, just like Mr. Rogers did. I mean, uh, who didn't love it when it came on? Like, won't you be my neighbor? <laughs> After your friends stiff you during the week, you know, you want to see Mr. Rogers. And then last week, uh, the movie last week was Incredibles 2. It was an animated movie, but it dealt with some real-life issues. You know, um, the wife Helen, you know, so many ladies, I'm telling you right now, so many superheroes are men, you know, but not, not in this movie. It was Helen, elastic lady. Some of you don't have elastic powers, but you ladies are stretched in a million directions, aren't you? You know, and so she became the superhero and got the call from superhero headquarters to go after a villain named Screen Slayer. How many of you know this if you have children? You have to be a Screen Slayer. You do know that? Get a basket and have them throw their... IT thing in the basket every once in a while and actually have a conversation with you. But, um, but uh, we have a picture, by the way, of six of our grandkids at our house all laying on the floor, each on some kind of device. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the age in which we live in. But with the key thought last week, right, because they had a mission, you know, that they had, a, they had accomplished, and they did it as a family. And so we have this mission, the mission that I believe God has given us, right, is that we would know God and then we would make him known. He wanted us to know him, but he wanted us to make him known. And when we looked at that movie, you know, we, we also looked at Jesus, and this is how he made himself known. Can I tell you what? He went where hurting people were. He felt their needs, and he did something about it. It's a great lesson for us if we ever want to make God known, because people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Trust me, people don't care how much you know about Jesus until they know how much you care about them. You know, so we talked about that last week, and this week the movie is Sergeant Stubby, an American Hero. It's an animated movie, but it actually happened in real life. There was this dog that wandered onto a base in Europe during World War I, and so uh, they took him in, and one of the soldiers named um, Robert Conray befriended this dog named Stubby. You know, and I think we have a picture of him. There he is. He got no tail. Like my nickname, I told you a couple weeks ago, was Mouse. I like Mouse better than Stubby. I'm just saying. You know, but this dog wasn't your average dog. You know, it was the first dog that was a, ever awarded, a dog awarded sergeant status in the U.S. military because of the dog's bravery first canine ever promoted like that. By the way, if you're going through adversity, this is a movie you want to see because it'll just lift your spirits. But a stubby wasn't the first one to display courage in the history of our nation. There was a guy named FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and his parents, you know, he grew up in a wealthy, influential home, but his parents did a great job of telling him to use his influence and wealth to help over the people. And so he became assistant, assistant uh, secretary of the U.S. Navy. And when he had that position, he was stricken with polio. And he lost use of his arms and his legs. Through therapy, he gained some use back of his arms. But whenever he walked, he had to walk with braces on his leg. And his friends were telling him, look, 
FDR, this would be a good time for you just to retire. You know, just retire. Just enjoy life. You got money. You don't need money. You don't need to help people. Just retire. But that wasn't in his, in his nature. And so he became a governor of New York State and then became the 32nd president of our country 11 years after he was stricken with polio. And so when he gave his inaugural address, inaugural address maybe you've seen this on tape, but uh, he shuffled to the po podium and began to face a nation that was in the middle of the Great Depression. One out of four people were out of work. Food was scarce. And he looked at the nation that day, and he came up with this phrase that became his legacy. And I made it the key thought of the message. We have nothing to fear, but fear itself. But fear itself. So I thought, you know, in this movie, I would just talk about fear just a little bit because we all face it. So here's some truths about fear. Uh, we live in an age of fear. That's the first feeling. You can go ahead and write that in. We live in an age of fear. And what I mean by that is it's not something that just began to grip us in this generation. It's been here since the beginning of time. Adam and Eve are in the garden. They're enjoying the presence of God. F food is everywhere. And then they sin. They ate something he said, don't eat. And so at that point, they ran and hid from God. They used to have morning walks together. And this one day, God shows up, and they're not there. And they're hiding. And so God calls out to them and says, Adam, where are you? And pretty soon he steps out from behind a bush. And God says, why were you hiding? <clears throat> and Adam says these words, I was afraid. Now when you look at the Bible, fear is cast throughout the Bible in different situations. Until you get to the book of Revelation. Last book of the Bible. And then Paul begins to talk about, I mean John begins to talk about heaven. And he describes heaven like this. He says, and the gates will be open, and there will be no more night there. When he originally wrote those words, he was writing to a group of people that every city around, what they would do to protect the city is they would build walls and put in heavy gates. I mean, it's kind of like us, isn't it? When we get afraid, we build a wall around ourselves. And what was he saying? He's saying, in heaven... You won't need gates and you won't need walls. He goes on to say, there will be no more fear when we get to heaven. But until then, fear will be a part of every generation. So we do a lot of things to alleviate it. I didn't understand it was this way, but maybe you could help me out just in a poll. It's been said that a third of the people in our country have trouble sleeping at night. Anybody? I mean, maybe not all the time, but we've had them. And so we, do a, we spend billions of dollars to help us fall asleep. <laughs> this one lady called the doctor, true story, and she called the doctor. She said, come quick, it's my husband. He said, what's the problem? He said, when he got up this morning, he took a vitamin pill, ulcer medication, pill tranquilizer, antihistamine, appetite depressor, and an anxiety medication. And then he lit a, lit a cigarette, and there was a big explosion, huh? Yeah, we'll do a lot to alleviate the fear we live with. Second thing is this, right, that um, our fears can change with time. They can change with time. Every generation is gripped with fear, but they may not be the same for every generation. As a matter of fact, every society on the face of the earth has fear triggers. So check this out, U.S., right? Five greatest fears of kids 40 years ago. Ready? Animals, dark rooms, Strangers, high places, loud voices. Forty years ago. Five greatest fears of children today. Divorce, nuclear war, cancer. Here's a big one. This one's going to rise up the chart. Shootings and STDs. It speaks volume, doesn't it, of the age we live in? The third thing is this, that fear can imprison people. It can imprison people. It keeps us from reaching our potential. You, I like the guy who said, uh, I don't swim or fly. And somebody said, why not? And they said, he said, I don't do anything that when you stop doing it, you die. <laughs> you guys laugh more than the, the other two services. You know, I was going to drop the joke. I'm glad I didn't. Yeah, don't we, don't we all know people like that? 
It's almost like they're afraid to walk because they don't want to fall. Or they're afraid to run because they don't want to stumble. Or they're afraid to look because of what they may see. Fear can paralyze us. It can rob us of some stuff. It can rob us of our best of ourselves. It can rob us of the best that we have to give to other people. And it can rob us of the best that we have to give to God. So when you look at the Bible, right, it's full of people who demonstrated faith in the midst of fear. Let me name some. Moses, when he stood before Pharaoh. David, when he stood before Goliath. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Daniel in the lion's den. Jesus on the cross. Peter walking on water in a bad storm. So what I'd like to do is just stay with the last one. Peter walking on water. And, and we're going to stay with like two verses of Scripture today. Because there's so much here about fear that we can learn. So um, just so you know, the disciples are in a storm. Jesus comes to them walking on the water. Peter says, can I go and walk on the water with you? And so the scripture goes on to say, yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went on the other side of the boat, walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind, the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. So how do we face reality? We, I think we got to understand the fear cycle. Because I don't know about you, but when fear sets in on me, it can happen that quick. And sometimes if we can just break the thing down and figure out what's going on with fear, it can help us a whole lot. For the first step in the fear cycle is reality. Reality is nothing more, right, than what we perceive about the fear-producing situation. It could be a fear of losing a job. It could be fear of losing a marriage. It could be fear of losing our health. It could be fear of a child who wanders in some things that are dangerous when they're in their 20s. So let me give you a, a quick background, paraphrase. Jesus and the disciples had a full day of ministry. Jesus, at the end of the day, said, let's move on. He said to them, you take the boat, I'll walk. I think he needed some alone time. So they're in the middle of the lake. He's walking. It gets dark, and a storm comes up, like a big, bad storm. They were like a cork on the water in that boat that day. And Jesus, Jesus comes walking to them on the water. And so Peter says, wow, Jesus, that's really cool. Paraphrase. He said, can I do that water thing? And he gets out of the boat, and Jesus says these words to him, right? He says, uh, yes, come. So Peter went out, on the, uh, out over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, can I tell you what happened when he saw that? Reality set in. The winds of opposition were around him. We know that, don't we? We know what that feels like to us. And he's standing on the water. Now, some would say that it was the wind and the waves that made Peter fearful. Can I tell you what? I push back on that. I don't think that's what it was. The wind was blowing when he got out of the boat. The storm was all around him. The waves were high, the night was dark, and the wind was heavy. The wind didn't start blowing when Peter ex exited the boat. It was already blowing when he was in the boat. No, I don't think he was afraid because of the wind and waves. I think he was afraid because he lost his focus. In the beginning, he was focused on Jesus, but now he's focused on the wind of the waves, and the scripture said he was gripped, gripped by fear. I have found this true, right? That there are some people in life, understand this, right? There's, it's not the size of the storm or the problem that matters. I know some people who have big problems that never seek Jesus' help. I know some people with little problems that seek him in every situation. It doesn't have to do with the size of the problem. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with our focus. Faith can help us when we're in fear. So if you're a member or resident of Ohio, I think automatically you are an Ohio Buckeye fan. I was in uh, Columbus, Ohio on homecoming day one year, which is where the university is. Those fans are crazy. I'm not kidding. I thought Bill's fans, they're really crazy. I had to drive for two hours to, to, to be able to find a radio station that didn't have the game on. 
Woody Hayes was a longtime coach of the Ohio State Buckeyes football team. He talks about the time that he walked into that stadium for the first time, began to look at the seats all around the stadium. He began to picture 86,000 people critiquing every decision that he made. And he said there when he was sitting there with his nine-year-old son holding his hand, that when he was sitting there, he became overwhelmed with fear. And his nine-year-old son was looking at his dad, and he had that look in his eye like he was afraid. And so the boy looked up at his dad, and he said, Dad, <clears throat> don't look at the seats. Look at the football field. It's the same size of every field you've ever coached on. No, no, you know, reality is really important when we're in the middle of it. The next thing is Peter had a response. The second phase of the fear cycle is a response. And here's his response. When, uh, by the way, I put this in there. When we focus on the problem, we have fear. When we focus on God, fears subside. I'll give you a minute to write that in. Got it? Next step, response. Our response. He goes on to say, but when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified. Peter saw the waves around him and he became terrified. Not just afraid, like terrified afraid. What we perceive in a storm produces an emotional response. I read this a while ago. This article said this about worry and fear. It said 60% of our worry or fear are unwarranted because they will never come to pass. Have you ever worried about something that never happened? 20% are from the past and we can't do anything about them. 10% are so petty, it doesn't make a difference. But you know this, don't you? I found this in my life. When I begin to worry about some big things, all of a sudden I'm worried about all the little things too. Only 5%, the article said, are what I would call legitimate fears. How many of you know what fear feels like? I don't know about you. Can I tell you what? It starts in my belly. Then it starts to move to my chest. Then it starts to move to my head. I don't know what your process is, but fear has a way of taking us over. I remember when we were first in ministry, uh, somewhere around uh, the first three or four years of ministry uh, in Amherst, New York, we would travel back to Endicott, New York, our hometown, uh, just to see our family for familiarity and encouragement. And so we were coming back from there one day, and it was in February at night, and we came uh, up the 390 just before Dansville. And I don't know about you, I think it always snows there. And so we came up, and it was a bad snowstorm, and uh, it was a little bit late at night, and our kids were about nine or seven, and so they were awake in the back seat. And there was a tension in the car because there's three or four inches of snow in the, the passing lane and only treads going down the, the lane that we were in. And my daughter, who was nine at the time, leaned up from the back seat, and she said, uh, Daddy, can you see? And I said, yeah, honey, I said, I can see. And five minutes later, that little girl was sound asleep in the back seat. She didn't know it. But I looked to my father, which art in heaven, and said, Daddy, can you see me right now? You may not know it, but I'm in a storm. I don't mind being in storms when I'm all alone, God, but I'm traveling with my family, and there's nobody around. Can you see me? It's a response that we have during it. The third thing is, is this. It's result. There's a result. Now watch the progression here. This is why I stayed with like two verses of Scripture today. You got to watch this progression because he goes, he, Peter, was terrified, and he what? He began to sink. Do you know this? Have you experienced this about fear? That fear has a way of making us plunge sometimes? It has a way of making us plunge. Oh, what's the process with that? Because fear can happen that quick. It just buzzes around our head and pre before we know we're acting on it. But I just say there's a couple, a couple things that take place in that, that second before we actually experience overwhelming fear. The first thing is perception. Right, perception. He saw the storm. Then there was a feeling that followed. He was terrified. And then there was an action. He began to sink. I've said this before, but, but 
we think it, we feel it, and then we act on it. Perceptions are powerful, and they have a powerful result. I put this in there. Our, our outlook often determines our outcome. So could I re rewrite the scripture with faith put in the center of the scripture? And Peter, stepping out of the boat, focused on Jesus. He began to walk towards Jesus. He felt courage and he felt confidence until he reached the Lord. And they embraced, standing on the water in the middle of the storm. That's a possibility. It's a possibility for every one of us. As long as Peter, Peter focused on Jesus, he could stand on the storm. But when he took his eyes off him, he began to see, look, it's the same for us. We can face a financial storm if we keep focused on Jesus because then we know it's going to be okay. We could face a relationship storm if we focus on Jesus because we know it's going to be okay. We could face a health storm when focused on Jesus because we know it's going to be okay. What we perceive is what we receive. You say, where'd you get that from? Okay, book of Proverbs. As a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. Reality, response, result, ret return. I love this part. The minute Peter realized that he was in trouble, the scripture goes on to say he was terrified and began to seek. He cried out, Lord, save me. How many of you prayed that prayer? How many of you waited too long to pray that prayer, huh? He just cried out, Lord, save me. And, and so good news, right? The same God who helped David with Goliath, the same God that helped Moses with Pharaoh, same God that helped Paul when he was in a Philippian jail, same God that helped uh, Mary and Martha when they're at the grave of their brother who had died, the same God that helped the demon-possessed man is the same God that can help you and me. He is not in a recession. He's not in a depression. And the same resources that were available to those folks are available to us. So this couple saved enough money. They don't go to our church, I don't think. But they saved enough money to buy a Mercedes so that they came and they were going to buy it. They go to the dealership and they, they're ready to sign the paper. And the, they, they look at the salesman and they say, how much horsepower does this Mercedes have? And the salesman said, I don't know. So he went behind the curtain to talk to the guy behind the curtain. Do you ever wonder if there's really a guy behind the curtain that they talk to? I don't think there's anything back there, you know? And so he goes back there, he comes out, he says, I got the answer. I don't know the exact number, but it's adequate. Oh, I want you to know today that the God of the universe that we serve is totally adequate to handle whatever fear we have. There is nothing new under the sun. He has seen it all, and he can come to our help. The last part of it is this, the rescue. The rescue. Can you imagine this with me? Peter cries out, Lord, save me. He's terrified. God reaches down, grabs this, this rough fisherman by the collar, and he pulls him up out of the water. And Peter is dripping, and he's cold, and he's shaking because he was terrified. And Jesus begins to pull that fisherman close to him, and he whispers in the air, his ear, I got you. You are safe now. It's going to be all right. Jesus would say the same thing to us when we're in the middle of a storm or in the middle of fear. He would say, I got you. You're safe now. It's going to be all right. So closing tips, right? Some closing tips. Choose faith over fear. Choose faith over fear. So 365 times in the Bible, the Bible says fear not. Somebody grabbed me out of church today. They said, Pastor Rick, isn't it interesting that there are 365 days in the year and 365 days that Jesus said fear not. See, this is what the deal is with faith or fear. It's a choice. It's a choice 
that we make. Fear not is a choice. So I would say cling to him. And that's a choice. Now, if you took nothing else out of this message, this is like I'd put a circle around this and put stars around it. Every opportunity to fear is an opportunity to trust God. The next thing is this. Focus on things you can control. <laughs> How many of you have an answer to someone else's problem? Don't you? I mean, you're like, how difficult can this be? Just do this. But when it comes to us, we are full of excuses, aren't we? Pastor Rick, I hear your message, but I can't control my attitude. I can't control my anger. I can't control my addiction. I can't control my mind. I can't control my fear. No, no, no. Let me tell you, this is what we can't control. We can't control what happens to us. We only have control over what happens in us. Peter couldn't control the wind, waves, or water, but he could control his focus. You say, how did Peter control his focus? Next tip, when fear returns, return to God. One of the signs of misplaced focus is when our life is dominated by fear. One of the signs of misplaced focus is when our life is dominated by fear. So these two ladies, right? One is called Betsy Ten Boom, and the other one is called Corey Ten Boom. And I was around when Corey was talking to people, but they, they, they were two sisters sentenced to life in a Nazi prison camp. And Betsy died in the camp. She got ill, and she died. And before she died, she took a hold of her sister Corey's hand. And she said, Corey, if you ever get out of this place, and Corey did, she was released at the end of the war. She said, you go tell people everywhere, no matter how deep the pit is, God is deeper still. So like we're still quoting her words. I tell you today, in your life, no matter how deep the, the pit is, the God of the universe is deeper still. How about you? Are you dealing with an issue that's producing fear? Or maybe you just came out of one. Or maybe today you know someone that's dealing with one. Can I ask you a question? How's your faith? How's your faith? You know, there may be some in the room today that you've really never put your faith in Jesus. You've heard of other people crossing the faith line. You've come all the way up to it. You don't, dis, you don't disbelieve in God. You just haven't put your faith in Him. Today could be your day. Dear God, I'm sorry. I was wrong. Please forgive me. I want to follow you in my life. And the scripture says that in an instant, Jesus enters our heart and becomes a part of our life. That is good news today. But there's others here, right? And you, you already have a relationship with Jesus. But your faith may be weak because you just didn't have one storm. You had two, three, or four storms hit over the last period of time. So I was praying this morning for you as I walked around this sanctuary. And I prayed for the group that doesn't, hasn't accepted Jesus yet and the group that's accepted him but their faith is weak. I prayed this prayer. God, help them to trust you again. Help them to trust you again. And I pray that that happens. So how about if you do this? Why don't you just bow your heads and maybe you have a situation you're, you need to pray over. Now's your moment. Maybe you have a friend that's going through a hard time or a family member. You need to pray for them. Pray for them right now. Let's pray together.